Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the launch of 2040 by Jory Graham. So it's Jory's 12th collection with Carcanet and 15th collection overall. Um, we're very excited to have Jory with us tonight, as I'm sure you are all too. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Lucy and I work at Carcanet Press. Um, I will be handing over to our host this evening, Robert McFarlane, in just a few minutes. Um, but I've just got to run a few, uh, throw a few little housekeeping bits first. So tonight's event will last for about an hour in total. Um, as I think a lot of you have found, we do have a chat box on screen, so please use it. Um, let us know where you're joining us from. Let us know what you think of the reading. But um, before you send a message, just make sure that it's set to say um, that it's sending to everyone, because otherwise um, we're not going to see it. There is also a Q&A function. So during the reading, if you do have a question for Jory, um, you can write them in there, and then Robert will pick some out um, to ask Jory towards the end of the event. Um, you're in control of your screen, so we will be sharing the poems on screen during the reading, um, but you're in charge of how it looks. So if you want to reconfigure it, have a play around, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, but if you do have any technical problems or questions, just drop us a message and we'll see what we can do to help. Um, I think, oh wait, no, one last thing. Um, thank you for paying your two pounds to be here. So it's redeemable against the cost of the book. So I've shared um, the code in the chat but I'll send it again at the end of the event and um, we'll follow up as well tomorrow with an email just so you can make sure you've got it. Okay, now I think that is everything. Um, so now it's time to hand over to our host who is um, Robert McFarlane. So Robert is an author whose books include The Old Ways, Landmarks and The Wild Place. He's also written films including River and Mountain, uh, both of which starred Willem Dafoe, amazing. Um, he was awarded the E.M. Forster Award for Literature in 2017, and he is a fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge. So welcome, Robert. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening to those joining from the from the UK and Ireland. Uh, good morning, perhaps if you're out on the west coast of, of North America somewhere. Good afternoon if you're somewhere in between. So as you can see, we've got a, a chat function running. Uh, it's lovely to see, if perhaps just give us a wave, say where you're zooming in from. It's lovely. I love getting a sense of this sort of dispersed, distributed geography of these wonderful um, events in these virtualized times and these communities that come together. Uh, I can already see some some familiar names uh, and some very well-known names. Lovely to, to see friends and um, people whose writing I hugely admire joining us from around the world. Um, I'm Rob, Robert McFarlane. I'm a writer. I'm Jury's interlocutor this evening. And that task makes me um, very happy, happy beyond easy expression. And there is, a, there is a little bit of history here in that I first met Jory's work when I was a graduate student in Oxford in the late 90s, 1998. I remember it very clearly. I was working then on the interrelations of contemporary poetry and science, which was setting poetics fizzing then, as it has done in many ways before and since. And I met the Dream of the Unified Field there, which was the collected poems or selected poems, 74 to, to 94. Uh, it won Jory the Pulitzer Prize. It absolutely swept me as so many readers off my feet, and it set me spinning like an electron around the nucleus of her poetry. And it's an orbit that I am still in, delightedly, exactly 25 years later. Um, Jory doesn't need much introduction to an audience such as you, but I will say that her poetry has won pretty much every prize there is going, including the Pulitzer, that she is also a, an astonishing uh, critic of poetry. Um, she will probably deny this when, we, when she gets a chance to speak, but so I will say it for the truth that it is now. She um, she succeeded Seamus Heaney, as many of you will know, as the Boston Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory at, at Harvard. And she is writing more now and faster than ever. And I was um, very happy to be asked to write the introductory essay to the quartet, the tetralogy of Jory's work that, that, that came out well, it seems only only last month. Um, these were poems written between 2002 and 2020. And now we have um, to 2040. And it, 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 it's a dazzling book, absolutely dazzling. I, I, I fell headfirst into it. And uh, I, I, it, it what, what's happening in Jury's poetry now is what I've always seen, but only 
better now understanding it has this extreme acute contemporaneity um she feels like she's right out there at the front where this fine blade of body and mind splits and sorts the gales on rushing atoms and that is exactly how it felt to to, to read this she writes into 2040 you feel the suddenly uh, and that as a single line I think catches it for me these poems they have a burning intensity and an experiment uh, reading it now this year this month this week as the river Po in Italy deadpools already as the forests of Alberta burn I, I wrote to Jory and I the only simile I could come up with it, it when you magnify sunlight and it it narrows down cones down to that white hot bead that then scorches and traces its mark and chars utterance and that's what she's doing here I think she's concentrating so much of what it means to be alive right now and using that that white hot concentration to write and to somehow try to keep pace with this accelerated everyday Anthropocene that we live on in and also trying to speak and we'll talk about this to or into a future or futures to 2040. Um, uh, I would love questions from you. I'm going to ask Jory a few. She's threatened to ask me one back, um, uh, but please put those in the question and answer box so I can see them rather than in the chat and I'll then gather those and put them to Jory uh, after she's read. Uh, that's more than enough from me. You want to hear from Jory and here she is. I'm going to disappear. Uh, please put your virtual hands together and welcome the amazing Jory Graham. Well, thank you, Robert. It's so weird not to see anybody, but um, hello. Uh, I can't see the chat box, but from Robert's introduction, I gather you're here from a lot of different places. So, um, so we make a planet, which is which is good. I'm going to read uh, three poems and trying to uh, give us time to have questions. It's incredible to have Robert, who you know we've never met in person, and this is the first time we've ever seen each other on Zoom. Um, so it, it's incredible for me to actually be introduced by someone whose work I admire probably above most other writing being done today. So it's a, it's a unique event. Um, I mean, to begin with uh, the first poem in this book, which uh, obviously is um, we're, we're here to the, in the hopes that you will uh, want to purchase it. If you are, have enough um, in the bank, you should purchase this one because Robert's introduction to this one alone, which is my prior four books assembled in one, um, is, uh, is worth the price of, uh, of the book. Incredible, beautiful introduction that taught me more about my work than um, I thought anyone could. And this is the poem uh, titled, Are We? The title runs into the, the first uh, line, as do many titles in the book. And, and Robert, don't ask me why um, I do that. I mean, I think I know why in this book formally that became a device that that is, you know, takes over most of the poems in the book. This idea of it being not untitled, but that the title is in the same register of voice as the first line. Normally, what a title does is precisely live in the silence in a completely different way than the first line. So for some reason, there's this um, desire to for that silence to not be broken in that way. Are we extinct yet, who owns the map? May I look, where is my claim? Is my history verifiable? Have I included the memory of the animals, the animals' memories? Are they still here? Are we alone? Look. The filaments appear of memories. Whose? What was land like? Did it move through us? Something says nonstop, are you here? Are your ancestors real? Do you have a body? 
Do you have yourself in mind? Can you see your hands? Have you broken it, the thread? Try to feel the pull of the other end. Says, make sure both ends are alive when you pull to try to re-enter here. A raven has arrived while I am taking all this down. Incorporate me, it squawks. It hops closer along the stone wall. Do you remember despair? It's coming closer, says. I look at him. Do not hurry, I say, but he is tapping the stone all over with his beak. His coat is sun. He looks carefully at me because I am so still and eager. He sees my loneliness. Cicadas begin. Is this a real encounter, I ask? of the old kind when there were ravens? No, says the light. You are barely here. The raven left a long time ago. It is traveling its thread, its sky road forever now. It knows the current through the cicadas, which you cannot hear but which close over you now. But is it not here, I ask, looking up through my stanzas? Did it not reach me as it came in? Did it not enter here at stanza eight? And where does it go now when it goes away again? When I tell you, the raven is golden. When I tell you it lifted and went, and it went. Um, this poem is titled In Reality, which runs into the first line. In reality, the river was still widening as it went, as it carried me, thick mists rising off it all day was still widening, yes, for a while longer, holding the sky in its belly and back, me on my back in the small of my boat, rudder jammed, or lost, or is it I tossed it some long time ago when I imagined myself to be free. In the distance I see, Reflected in the spooling, a pair of spyglasses lifted by the surveyor, fitted out for life. And it seems he is laughing at what he sees, so magnified, lights splaying over the surfaces, the smeared faces of kings whose lands are now vanquished. Clouds folding in the waters, their rolled up blankets no longer needed for the ceremonies, the dancing, controlling ebb, controlling flow. And like candy, the benzines, the tankers before me have trailed. And like wedding veils, the foam made of monies, a few millennia of monies, no slack in that accrual, no slowdown in that accumulation. We were fitted out for life. <clears throat> no slack in that accrual. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
No slowdown in that accumulation. We were fitted out for life, armed with evolution and imitation. Trees casting their calligraphies deeper and deeper as they try to tell the story of the bend we are now approaching. A parrot flew over. It crossed the whole river. I took a moment to sit up and watch, took in the setting, took in the dead forest, the ruined brick smokestack just visible from a clearing. Some columns still standing beyond it, someone's unyielding idea of happiness. Everything hangs in the balance, say the looping vines. The late red light begins articulating. Think about it, they scrawl. Try to remember what it was you loved. Try to clean up your memories in time. The dragonflies begin as I lie back down. I try to recall how I've gotten this far. Every wing in the swarm also benzene rainbowed and clouding me as we round the bend. And everywhere, their eyes, their thousands of eyes. They see nothing we see, I think. And am I a ghost now? My left eye stung shut, my right eye trying to make out what's up ahead as the light goes gold. Isn't it beautiful, the old world says? I try to remember. My one eye weeps. Along the bank, I make out the easels now. I see smocks and pallets and always that one hand up in the air, tapping and pointing, caressing the emptiness through which whatever it is they are seeking arrives, that down it goes onto its canvas. Represent me, says the day. Quick, there's no time to lose. Represent my million odors. Represent my shaking grasses where the wind picks up and the river narrows and the dream of forgiveness is replaced by desire. Forgive me, I think, as the silt everywhere widens. The light is failing. The dried banks show through. Now the surveyor is packing his tools. I feel his gaze cross my forehead inadvertently feel the painter's gaze brush my eyes without knowing. The smoke from the dead stack is filling the river, though it's just the riverbed coming up to meet us. The lover of dead things flies by gingerly. First bats swing across, so absent of greed. I look down at my hands, the air shrieking a little. I figure the new swarms will be mosquitoes. I lie in my going. I have nothing to contribute. The world was always ready for the world. The river is running thin. I see the fish on the banks with no birds around them. Human heart, I say to myself, what are you doing here? This is far too much for you to lay eyes on. The young fish float in the brackish water, the slowing current, the cries of the dusk birds like shattering glass, one cry and they're done. To whom am I singing? The winning ticket is still in my pocket. The disappearing lovers are still in my satchel. I have the stories we needed ready. I understand the comings and goings called grief. It is then that I see the river is ending. The dusk hits its silver. It thinks it's a jackpot. 
the water is down to a handful of jewels tossed out here and there on the miles of dry sand. That's all I recall. Then the keel hits and I'm tipped over gently as if to be fully and finally poured out. I am told by the cracks in the sand, the whole length of the bed, to get up now, to gather belongings. I am told to hurry and join the line, to take my place, prepare my ticket, and if I have a chance, to choose disappearance. Told I might still get lucky, might still get out. Out to where, I wonder, looking back at my skiff, at the millions of hulls in this dried bend, supplies are strewn everywhere on the dead bed, flashlights in dusklight picking us out, almost invisible, the plastics gleam. Thus it was we came to no longer reach the ocean. Flow rate failed. Flow direction failed. Surface water disappeared. Subsurface dried. I remember the spring, the headwaters, precipitation, swell. I see again the currents begin the sweet cut into land of channels, meanders. Remember the turns. Put my hands in the springs, the groundwater recharge, the slow, delicate fanning of the drainage basin, the mouth, the confluence, the downriver arrivals, delta, Sediment yield, salt tide, open the sea. Well, I'm going to end on this poem uh, time frame. Poems have an effect on me too. Ah, sorry. I don't think it's sentimental to be moved by poems that one wrote after all. I put my heart into them. My work really isn't all about consciousness. <clears throat> um, this poem, um, has the presence of a clairvoyant in it, um, actually um, a real person in life, uh, though she becomes more imaginary in this poem, augury, divination, prophecy of the kind that she's um, imparting in this poem, obviously has a, a long poetic tradition, ancient, uh, probably from its origins. Um, more recently, you might recognize someone who could have been in, in T.S. Eliot. Um, in this poem, um, there's more history than in the, the last poem I read. It actually, I wrote this uh, during the, um, um, the invasion of Ukraine. And then while I was um, in um, writing the poem and undergoing my own uh, medical treatment and the, the war was more and more in detail, uh, entering into our lives, um, that you will notice things like sunflowers. Um, and yes, they're supposed to refer um, to the sunflowers that are one of the uh, symbols of Ukraine. Um, but obviously, it, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Um, and, and I guess I'm ending on this poem because one of the wishes um, as we go through this poem and when we get to the end is you know, how to survive this um, living simultaneously in, in uh, 
one's own personal time and in history and in um, you know short-term history, long-term history, geologic time, um, planetary time, the the time in which climate chaos is visible to us, the, the lifetime of a river. Um, so uh, the poem is titled Time Frame. It does not run into the first line, the title. And um, it, uh, it does uh, try to, um, oh, I should say that this poem in the book is surrounded by many poems in which the sun, um, as, the, as the poet, uh, as the poems project into the future, um, many poems in which the sun has become too hot for us to be outdoors or too hot for us to inhale under certain circumstances. <clears throat> so the ending of um, this poem, I'm just gonna get a glass of water, sorry. So the, the fact that there's sun in this poem is surrounded by other poems that have that kind of a situation, a lot of drought and drought throughout most of the book, except for, and a lot of waiting for rain in the book. Time frame. The American experiment will end in 2030, she said, looking into the cards, the charts, the stars, the mathematics of it, looking into our palms, into all of our palms, into the leaves at the bottom of the empty cup, searching its emptiness, its piles of dead bodies, or is it the grass at the edge of the field where the abandoned radio is crackling at the winter stilled waters, the winter killed will of God, in the new world, now the old world, staring quietly without emotion into the rotten meat in the abandoned shops, moving aside with one easy gesture, the broken furniture, the fourth wall smashed and all the private lives of the high rise apartments exposed to the city and wind ash everywhere, the sounds of crying, loud then soft. It will not seem like it's dying right away, she said. What is the it you refer to, I ask? Is it a place? Is it an idea? A place is an idea. An idea is for a while a place. Look, she says, there are two fates. One is the idea, one is the place. And everywhere I see water, as in blessing, as in baptism, as in renewal. No, as in the meadows disappear under the sea. Then I heard a sound in the far distance where her gaze rested. Are those drums? Are we in the distant past or the distant future, I ask? The witches float in the air above us. There are three. Of course there are three. They have returned. No, your ability to see them has returned. Your willingness. She asked for cold wine and a railway schedule. It was time, she said, to move on, her gaze looking out at the avenues and smaller streets, at the silk dresses on the mannequins and storefronts, all of them across the planet, the verandas poking out under the hemlocks, violin strings crossing from one century to another, although now I could hear they were sirens all along, invisible and desperate, the warnings in their rise and fall. Are you not listening? Are you not listening? Yet those are sirens, yes, those are sirens in the street, but here 
up close in the recording of the orchestra, the violin solo has begun. It is screaming from one ruined soul to another to beware, to pull the bloody bodies from the invisible where we are putting them daily. No, every minute, no, faster. We are obliterating the one chance we had to be good. There it is, the word. It brings us up short. I notice she is gone. The American project, she had said, putting the words out into the kitchen air with some measure of kindness. It was not the only one, she said, but it was the last one. After that, time ran out. We both looked out the window, still shocked by the beauty of the moonlight in this spring. Are we running out of springs, I had wanted to ask? Is the oxygen? Will there be no more open channels? Can one not live beneath? A little life in the morning? Crazed police cars in the distance? But here, this sunflower, which seeded itself, seeded its mathematics and religion in our tiny backyard, will do. The creaking door handle we love. The spider we help come back after each wind by letting the hanging vine which needed to be trimmed just stay. Just stay, I whisper to myself. Stay under. Don't startle time. The sentry will go by. You can mind your own business. You can finger the rolled up leaf, feel its veins. You can watch the engines go by over all the bridges above you. You can remain unassimilated. The American project, she said, will end in 2030. Said, find land away from here. Find trustworthy water, have it in place by then. I paid her. I saw the bills go into the pocket in her purse. Her shoes were so worn, her terror was nowhere. I looked at my garden. It was dry here and there. The shoots were starting up. Like a dream, they were poking through the rusty fence. I am spending my life, I thought. I am unprepared. It is running through my fingers. The wind is still wild. My bones hurt sometimes, causing pain. It is not terror. I feel for the cash in my pocket. I do not have time to prepare. I am comfortable. Time passes and I am still here. I am getting by. I replace one calendar with another. I put seed out for birds and sometimes one comes. Once I saw two. The spider is still here. I remember how geese used to fly over. It meant something. I remember when there were planes and I could see them catch the light up there. What a paradise. Some people had enough. They were not happy, but they were able to come and go at will. They could leave their houses at any time, any time, and go where they wished. Sometimes we shared ideas. It filled the time. We agreed or we did not. They were not afraid. I was not afraid. Summer would come soon. It would get warmer. It might rain too hard. When it flooded, we worked to fix it. We did as we saw fit. Hi neighbor, we would say across the fence to the one tending their portion of the disaster. It will be okay again soon, one of us would say. We were allowed to speak then. It was permitted. One of us might dream. 
one of us might despair. But we cleaned up the debris together. And the next day, sun came. And we were able to sit in it as long as our hearts desired. Hello, everyone. I'm just letting that resound a little in the moment. Um, Jory, that was that was mesmerizing. Um, it was an extraordinary privilege to sit and listen to that um, that voice, that speaker, your rhythms, um, those words. Uh, they felt um, and the range of poems you read to us as well, uh, and ending as you did. Um, it was a hugely powerful experience. I can't remember being moved by poetry like that for a long time. So from my heart on the 99 million year old chalk of South Cambridge, um, thank you. And I know that people around the world will be feeling that too. It, I was very struck by your, 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 your own tears at your own poem and, and your, uh, your absolutely correct to me um, sense that it isn't sentimental to be moved by a poem one has written, especially when the poem is seen and told through the, the compound eye that you that you create, which is so far from that 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 monadic ego of the that never really existed of the lyric voice. But um I, I just I I know I want to ask you lots of things, but could you just tell us a little bit about being moved by a poem that one has written because it was such a fascinating moment. Well actually that's never happened to me. Oh. Um, but I think it was those lines about the river reaching the sea. Um, mm. actually, I'm just going to get overwhelmed with emotion again. Um, it, it wasn't so much the poem as it was the, the actual set of details that it takes to go from a spring mm. to a river to an ocean. I don't have to tell you about that. You know, you're, you're hopefully going to soon give us a book about how, you know, a river, the, what, what the aliveness of a river is. Um, it's partly that I know that you're doing that. I watched your film on it and uh, um, you had mentioned the River Po. And by the time I got to the, the memory of, the, the orig of how little it takes for the earth to give forth this trickle with this complex mechanism, which will make for a river and that we could kill off a river. I just was, I, that's what, it wasn't so much the poem as, um, when I got to the words open sea, I, I think it was that. And I don't have to tell you about it. You're, as I said before, the river god here. So, <laughs> Well, I, I, um, I, so, I sometimes talk to people about the aliveness of rivers and those who are somewhat resistant to the notion that it might, it might be alive in its own right rather than the sum of the assembly of the beings that inhabit and are enlivened by it. Um, I say, well, if you can't imagine a living river, can you imagine a dead river? And of course, instantly anyone can. It's, as you say, it is the river that does not reach the sea. It is the river who has, I see the fish on the banks, on the banks with no birds around them, human heart, I say to myself, what are you doing here? This is far too much for you to lay eyes on. Uh, it is then that I see the river is ending. Uh, this was, yeah. It was um, it was extraordinary and um, felt as though it had been written directly into the estuary of my brain at the moment. So I thank you for it personally. Um, I feel like that trying to understand what is living around us. You know, we have endless books about you know the, how forests think and you know how you know and we we're constantly sort of informing ourselves about how uh, alive. Um, the non-human uh, rest of this planet, which I like to sort of still call by the old term creation, um, mm -hmm. without a religious uh, inflection is. Um, and, and yet I just feel like the, the difference between knowing it and feeling it um, sometimes requires the very uh, complicated acts of imagination. Um, and uh, it, it really does mean trying to figure out uh, ways of relocating uh, your own uh, soul so that you can make an, an aperture for um, uh, 
you know, the, uh, if we don't actually believe as much as we believe that our own children are alive, if we don't actually believe that other species, um, that, you know, other parts of creation are alive, we are not going to be able to awaken, no matter how much information we have, we're not going to be able to awaken that part of our soul, which I don't think is extinct, which I don't think is dormant, but which I believe can be awakened to take action. But it is, you know, it is drastic action and it is urgent. And, um, but, you know, part of what this, the, the, the peculiar aperture of this book, which is to go into the future and imagine backwards what it was we had so we might see it. Um, sometimes when, you know, when you lose someone that you love, and then you think back on them, or you think, you look at photographs of when you were together and you were, you know, that person was alive, you suddenly realize what you had. Um, and, yes. and it overwhelms you because you think, how could I not know that I had that at the time? It often happens with a parent, you know, like, how can I not know how wonderful this human being was, you know, when I was just taking them for granted? And so it, we can't afford to do that with the earth. So that's part of this, you know, way of thinking yes and and this is art's work in this in this respect is to make the river as as alive as the as the child in a in a way um you i was trying to think about the tense of this collection i mean it has many many tenses but one of them is the the one you've just touched on the sort of the will have been the writing the writing to a future that will look back and wish and wish we might wish to know what it was like. You said in, in this new brilliant New Yorker interview you did, which I commend to everybody, perhaps Jazz could put the link in the in the chat. You say, I take speaking the past to the future to be a primary moral responsibility of the art of poetry. And, and that too, to the future, is there in the title as well, to 2040. And I, I wonder if you could tell us about that little word. Um, well, first of all, um, you know, the, just looking at the word 2040 with an address to it, um, gives it a kind of, um, uh, living entity. It's as if there was someone, you know, something, some, um, like, uh, uh, you know, something that in Dickinson's 812, when she says a light exists in spring, the way that entity almost comes about, it says, now that, why that particular year? Um, yeah. We've spent so much time being told in our lifetime about the, the risks of climate chaos, and they're always put um, at the end of the century and, you know, it, further and further away. And then this is actually the, the year um, where, you know, we go beyond, you know, any perceivable tipping point um, in terms of parts per million, as you know too well. And so um, it's also an interesting distance from us. Um, it's, it's almost impossible, it seems to me, and that's what the prior four books were trying to kind of think about, to think 10 generations into the future. It's very hard, but this is three generations into the future. Um, this is four generations. I mean, we should be able to activate our imagination in such a way to, Think, I mean, unless we believe that there's a thread, when I read that first poem and there's a, the idea of the thread that we have to connect and the, that the thread that the bird has disappeared on, we have to be able to feel that there is a connection between us and people in 2040, which is not, which is not approachable just through the conceptual intellect. We have to feel that this is, you know, our, our people, our descendants. Um, and so, you know, I put the year at, at a certain distance um, where we can all look at it and say, you know, my grandchild or my child will be that age at that time. So it's it's probably possible to begin to awaken a sense of, of that thread that connects it. Um, uh, you know, there's also the desire that not just that we're moving towards it inexorably and we see it there like a doorway or a threshold or sort of a a tipping point, but it's also the feeling that it is there. The year 2040 is there. It's inexorably there, whether we get to it or not, whether we get to it intact or not. So as the kind of entity that I sort of imagine it having, I see it as being able to speak back to us, to pull us along that thread towards it, to sort of say, see me here now. 
And I sort of move myself between the different um, portals in the book so I can speak back from that period and speak towards that period. And I feel there's a dynamic relationship. Um, but there's a prayer and a letter to it. And, a, and I, you know, a, a, if nothing else, a bearing of witness, you know, if, as, as I've said before, if the poems, if all the poems we write, if everything we make is dug up out of the rubble at some point, let it at least know, you know, that we knew it was there, that we saw it, that we acknowledged it. It's a kind of deity to me at this point, the idea of, of the way it, it's, it's uh, this unmovable mathematical presence of our time ahead of us. Um, and, you know, as I've said many times, it's, it's a mirror image. If you don't, if you can't think backwards towards ancestors, you can't think forwards. If you narrow yourself down to the present tense to where all you're living in is the now, which of course our entire technological universe is, you know, as desires us to do in order to monetize our present tense, which is pretty much the, the world that we're living in um, and monetize our distraction and monetize our um, lack of attention span, then we, it is precisely in order that we not be able to open up a channel to the, you know, that many years behind us and let it flow through us to that many years ahead of us. And, you know, our, our yes, the present tense is a very precious, like a pearl on this necklace, okay, but it dissolves at, at, at any given moment. And we have to be able to feel the, the I, I have many images for it in the book, this thread that pulls us between the ancestors and the future. And um, you know, we have a very short uh, lifespan. We should be able to contribute um, to the future what the ancestors have given us in some way. I mean, you know, everybody in their own way. Uh, I mean, our bodies do it, our DNA does it, our genetic code does it. I mean, everything else does it. Why can't we emotionally um, you know, listen to, um, you know, what, and you know, we, we do carry the past down in certain ways. You know, we have stories that we tell about, or we have we have traits from people that we used to belong to. And, um, most of us no longer have myths or stories or rituals or things that, that, that we carry forward. But if we do, your books are full of them. If we do, and we, we bring them into the present and we carry them into the future, we awaken that living current. And if we awaken that current, I believe we awaken the emotional and spiritual current within us that could be otherwise dormant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderfully put. Um... I, I think there's something very powerful actually in in holding 2040 solid as as a as a as a point that will be reached. It seems to me there's a there's a form of uh, as it were ecological catastrophic denialism that we all practice, which is which is that of kind of rolling it endlessly forward. So it becomes the Ulyssian arch that retreats in the measure that you approach it. And in that way, it will always be the, you know, the decade after the decade, but holding hard, you, you give us two dates, don't you? Because in 2030, the American project will reach its end, Cassandra tells us, or this, this kind of um, clairvoyant figure. But the problem for me was this is a real person and she's very gifted and that's the year she gave me. And I thought, uh, I got two different years to deal with. Okay, I have this exact, I mean, this is this this occurred. This is what she's, she's the person who advises, uh, you know, there's a group of astrologers and clairvoyants on the planet, a small group who actually work for governments. It wouldn't be a surprise to anyone to know that almost every government on the planet has somebody like that to put them on the same page, if you will, sort of like consulting the Oracle at Delphi, the Greeks and the Persians, right? And they interpret it the way they want. The only country that doesn't have that person is the United States. It's not a surprise. I think it would make sense to people. The United States is not the same thing. <laughs> uh, as the rest of the world in terms of what are good days to negotiate or whatever. But yeah, this, this person said this to me and I thought, that's not the year I'm working with. Yeah. I'm, I've, already, I've already got 2040 in place. And I thought, this is the truth, but it's what she said, I'm gonna put it down there. Well, uh, what, what the line is after it, time ran out. Find land away from here, find trustworthy water. Like I, She said that, I started looking for, like if I could afford land somewhere with water. I mean, I didn't make any of that part up. The drone I had as a vision in the book, the, the drone that appears and speaks to me. The woodpecker was like, practically like, I mean, real um, as a vision, but she, although she becomes a vision and all of these ode-like presences, you know, um, are, are visions that, you know, that I needed power and I drew power from their, their knowledge and their instruction, but um, I needed power in order to survive and, you know, strength is more than power. Um, but 
and courage, I guess, more than power. Um, but um, but she she said, find water find, and, and find it in time. And, find, and it was like, so I thought, why not pass this information on? People want it. This is, a, this is an instruction manual, this book, isn't it? As Barry Lopez would say, it's an instruction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just read the the epigraph from Barry, and then I'll a writer very dear to us both. I know, and then I'll open. I'll, be, I'll bring some of these questions um, to you, Jory. So, before you read that, can I say one thing? Everyone should look up your wonderful piece about meeting Barry Lopez. I think you. I don't know if it appeared in the Guardian or where it appeared, but it, every writer should read what it was like for one writer to meet a writer that they that they adore later in life. And what that encounter, I've learned so much from reading about that, that generosity and that, you know, that incredible humility in that man that you passed on to us. I never was able to meet him. So I just think it's a beautiful piece. Thank you, Jory. Yeah, it's, it's called Geography is Generosity, that, that piece. It's in, it's in Orion magazine. Um, uh, so there's just one line from Barry's book, uh, in, um, Embrace Fearlessly the Burning World, which was published, in fact, after his death on Christmas Day in 2020. And it just says, we are searching for the boats we forgot to build. Um, and at that point, I'll, I'll, I'll bring in some of these terrific questions. Um, uh, I, I think I might... Um, Can I say just say one thing about that, which is that... Yeah. I just want to point out that ships, boats that, you know, um, are crafts um, and that, uh, that the idea of craft and the idea of ship there overlap for me. So that there are, you know, um, yeah. uh, that if you forget to build your craft, you might not be able to get over the rapids kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to pick up a, 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 a formal question first and then I'll go to a temporal one, but I think we've, we've spoken a little about time. So we'll turn briefly to form, not that they're extricable. Uh, and it's from Paige, it's the, the um, penultimate uh, question. Would would you speak to the change slash evolution in form in, into 2014? And she's particularly interested in quatrains, which I know is something we were we were going to talk about. So yeah, the, there are the very short quatrains in the, in the early poems and then the title poem has page wide what trains? Well, the the briefly the only poem in long quatrains, which the prior book Runaway had used uh, consistently, pretty consistently, is the title poem. Otherwise, there's this sort of um, uh, you know I've always I've, I'm going to repeat myself here, but the, you know when you look at a poem, when you're making a poem, um, uh, the white space isn't paper. God forbid, it's not a screen, but it's not paper. Um, it's silence. And you have to understand that, you know, when you make a quatrain, um, first of all, you're, when you make any stanza, you're building out into the silence. Um, just because it breaks at, at line four um, doesn't mean that, you know, it's breaking because of a mathematical decision you've made about quatrains. It means that you have to make sure that what happens at line four at the end of it requires a pause, a hesitation, a need for delay, a, a not knowing, a something that, you know, or a, a full stop that closes something and, and takes a breath and doesn't know what to do next. So that the, the uh, silence between the end of a stanza and the beginning of the next one is an active space and not just an organizational um, uh, unit. That said, um, I, I love the, the, the quatrain has obviously a history somewhere between the, the ballad and um, the hymn and with these sh the shorter lines in this, it sort of it, it approaches the hymn a bit more. And I think that um, you know, if if nothing else, these poems um, um, are engaged with being a certain kind of, of hymn. Um, I do like the quatrain for another technical reason, which I'll just point out. And these these quatrains are quite different from any other short lines I've written before because they they break so they they just they break. Uh, um, um, they crumble in, in the face of the silence. The silence carries so much pressure of time and what's the deeper silences that we're thinking about now, silences where we might not uh, be here to even hear those silences. Um, those that what might replace us and maybe wonderfully fill this planet with other sounds, um, but that is pressing up against these lines. So the line breaks themselves and the, ways word, the way words break are, is sort of something that I've done sometimes embedded in longer lines, but never completely on their own this way. They're very exposed. But I should say about the quatrain, 
um, as opposed to the couplet, you know, I find the couplet very disturbing because the first line breaks the silence and the second line re-enters the silence. And I find that you, I don't know what to do with that much rapidity. And the tercet is very interesting, or the three line stanza, because of course it has one internal line and um, it's moving, it's looking outwards and then immediately outwards again, but it gives you a moment inside. And of course it has terza rima behind it and has Dante and you can do a lot with that. But the quatrain, okay, is this fantastic thing, which gives you, it breaks the silence and it gives you two whole lines in which to, act as if the silence isn't quite there, although you can put it into the margins and then you come to the fourth line and you encounter the silence again. And so, as I've said before, um, I actually put it in, in an interview and um, I was actually not, not thinking when I said it, but I'm gonna read it because I just think it's so great. I can't believe I said it. Um, <laughs> the, quatrain, the quatrain has an accelerator and a clutch. It can hover, it can almost come to a standstill and it can glide. And uh, I thought that was my description of the quatrain. But you can understand if you if if the silence is active for you, which I think is necessary for you to understand what voice is, yep. you have to be able to hear what the silence is doing. And and I, for me, the amount of pressure around uh, a couplet is 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 crushing, and the amount of silence in relation to a, a quatrain it gives rise to hymns and ballads, storytelling, and prayer. Beautiful answer. Thank you. Quatrain is gyrocopter. Uh, I remember Larkin describing them just as bricks to build churches with or something like that, but I much prefer your um, your, your gliding form. And it, it, it actually, that, that incredible answer does speak to N Nancy's um, question about emptiness, silence and, and blank space. Um, and there, there are other questions about justification in terms of um, uh, right and left justification, which have also sort of turned up in that. There's there's so many, um, so much appreciation here, uh, gratitude being expressed. Um, we've sort of got probably got time for one, uh, one last question because we're running late uh, or running to our end. Um, and I, I think I'll choose Jacqueline, Jacqueline Safras. So she asks, how do, how do you manage to live with this quality of radical empathy? this ability to look extinction in the eye and then describe it to us and for us? Well, first of all, um, I can't do it every day. Um, I have really bad days. And like anybody else, I have family, loved ones. I panic, I read way too much science. Um, I overwhelm myself. You know, my oncologist tells me like, just don't read any more about this, okay? so. It's not, but then I have to say that um, if I can just get out into the world, if I can just get my feet on the earth, and if I can just go out and be in it, especially one thing that I do a lot is because I'd lose my way when I go walking a lot. And I often come and I can't usually get my walk together till too close to the end of the day, really for my own good. So I often walk home, um, when it's a little bit darker, I mean, it's the kind of the time of day when if you're looking out, you think it's dark. But if you're if you're if you're still out in it, you you can kind of see. You become like a creature. Your peripheral vision is activated. You have to use your body in a completely different way. Under those circumstances, I feel like I can feel the earth. I mean, I can also feel it at dawn and at dusk and all. But under the circumstances where I'm, and I've and I did that a lot over the last winter. I was recovering from chemotherapy. So I was out walking, it got dark so soon. I ended up walking home in the dark a lot. And it's that transition. That's why there's so much dusk in, the, in, in this book. There's that transition when, you know, the day sounds begin to cease and the night sounds begin. And you have to hear and see and feel with all your senses and with extra senses that you don't really have. And as a result, your creaturehood is awakened. And I feel like if you can, re we have more empathy as creatures than we necessarily do as, as sort of, you know, thinking, thinking humans, but the creatural side of us connects almost instantly with, you know, tree, bird, bat, rock. So um, that helps me. Mm. Taking walk, getting my, I'm talking in front of the man who's taken the most extraordinary walks on earth, um, finding paths in places where there's not even land. I mean, so thank you, Robert. It's a the, the most amazing walk I've ever taken, I think was about a hundred yards long. Uh, it just happened to be stride for stride with the footprints of a Mesolithic walker who'd, you know, left his 
and her prints side by side in the silt on the foreshore and they'd then been uncovered so one doesn't need to walk far and Jory I hope one day we get to take a walk in the blue dusk and activate our rods and cones and um, and, and feel creaturely uh, that would bring me enormous happiness and um, there's a there's a wonderful phrase from David Nyman uh, in the chat after your reading he just said global goosebumps um, and I, th <laughs> I think I think that really catches it um, this was very special for me to hear you, and I can tell for 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 the hundred and more other people who who shared that time with you and and these incredible answers. So heartfelt thank thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, truly, and um, I think Lucy's going to come on and just um, just say goodbye now. So I'll 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 slip slip away into the dark tile, and um, yeah, uh, bless you, Jory, from all of us. Thank you so so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much, Jory. That was uh, that was amazing. That was so moving. And just, I mean, just look, just I mean, just look at the comments. Everyone else feels the same way. That was fantastic. Um, and Robert, thank you as well for being such an amazing host. Um, yeah, just brilliant. Um, I'll just uh, share the code again now, the discount code in the chat. Um, like I said, we'll also be sending an email tomorrow. Um Oh, I should have actually said earlier, please note that it is just um, for customers in the UK and Commonwealth, excluding Canada. Um, let's pop that in now. Um, and what? also... I can buy the American edition. Capra Canyon does have an American edition, so... Yeah, because unfortunately the discount won't apply. I'm sorry, but the two pounds was worth it because this was amazing, so... Um, great, and I'll just also share the details for the next online launch, which is next Wednesday. So that's um, NB by JC, a walk through the Times Literary Supplement by James Campbell. Um, and I'll share a link to our events page as well. Um, so we've got a lot of very exciting events coming up over the next few months. Um, I'm just I'm going to leave the event open just for a few more minutes, um, just so you can say goodbyes and thank Jory for tonight. Um, and yeah, I hopefully see you again at the next event.